Get ready to look now. Abracadabra! <gasps> Welcome back to EtymQuest, a show where the least qualified etymologists break down the planet's most curious word histories through the lens of the internet. This time we're talking food and drink. Tuck into our tasty trivia on the insta-friendly avocado, the humble roll with a hole, the bagel, the American favourite ketchup, and finally the tea caddy. Avocado, the Aztec symbol of love and fertility, is high in nutrients and even higher in price. Nowadays, people will go to extreme lengths to bag the pear-shaped sensation. In 2016, there was a string of large-scale avocado heists in New Zealand, and in Mexico, drug cartels want a piece of the action. The word itself links back to humanity's more primal urges. Avocado comes from Nahuatl word ahuacati, which means testicle. Avocados originally came from Mexico and Central America, where the indigenous Nahua people discovered them and got a giggle out of naming what they saw hanging from the trees. Scholars think the Nahua chose the word because of its suggestive shape and alleged aphrodisiac properties. When the Spanish conquistadors came, they changed the name to aguacate. In 1924, the US began growing their own avocados, though they found them a tough sell because Americans had a hard time saying the word. Marketers tried using avocado pear and alligator pear in reference to its shape. Eventually, they settled on avocado. The California grower Calavo created its own brand identity off the back of being America's first avocado planter. And in 1927, when avocado advertising began, Calvo set a record for reader responses with an ad in Vogue magazine, a trend-setting notoriety which continues in social media today. There are a few theories as to how the bagel began. One story says they came to prominence because of a pious Polish queen. During Lent, many Christians decide to give up something they love for 40 days. So chocolate, Netflix, Diet Coke. But for Queen Jadwiga, who was living in 15th century Poland, those things didn't exist. At that time, the roll with the hole was actually known in Poland as an avazanek, which evolved from the pretzel brought into the country by German immigrants. Written records of them appear as early as the 14th century. The Queen opted to eat a Varzanek during Lent instead of the more richly flavoured breads and pastries she enjoyed the rest of the year. Not exactly a punishment, you might think. And you'd be right. Back then, not only was producing wheat goods expensive, but it was also exclusive. And in that era, Jewish people were commonly banned from baking bread. This came from the belief that Jews were enemies of the church and so should be denied any bread at all because of its role in the sacrament. The bagel as a famously Jewish food really came of age during the era of Polish history known as the Nobles' Democracy, a kind of power to the people movement where the nobility fought back against the rich and powerful sovereign. That mindset paved the way for Jewish people to be given the right to boil and bake bread, most notably bagels. Another theory dates the first bagels to a baker in Vienna, Austria, who accidentally invented the chewy delicacy in the late 17th century. He made it as a tribute to the King of Poland, Jan Sobieski III, who led forces to save Austria from Turkish invaders. The baker, aware of the king's love for horses, shaped the yeast dough into a circle and called it Beugel, which is German for stirrup. The word then entered English in 1919 as Germans flocked to America, a word that originally came from the Yiddish word bagel. By the 1990s in America, bagels were one of the most popular street foods and even overtook the donut in popularity. The word origins of ketchup, that sticky sweet condiment, or the classic answer to faking blood, has also sparked fiery debate over the centuries. Most people say it comes from the Hokkien Chinese word, ketchup, meaning the brine of pickled fish, while others argue it is a Malay word originally. Fish sauce had made its way to China through trade routes from Vietnam, where it's called Nuk Mum. In 1889, the Reverend Hilderich Friend, who was a missionary in China and also author of a book on the folklore of plants, weighed in and said, I may say that the word ketchup is certainly not Chinese, for pretty superficial reasons, like the fact that if it was Chinese, the word should link to mushrooms, he said. He then suggested we look into the East Indies and the Burmese language for answers. 
Either way, the tomato bits of standard ketchup didn't come into play until 1812, when the scientist and horticulturalist James Mees wrote the first known recipe of tomato-based ketchup. He apparently referred to tomatoes as love apples, because, yep, you guessed it, tomatoes were then thought of as an aphrodisiac. Mises' recipe contained tomato pulp, spices and brandy, but it didn't have vinegar and sugar, so it would go off pretty quickly. In an attempt to keep the sauce fresher for longer, people started using preservatives, which turned out to be pretty bad for the body, like coal tar and benzoates. It was not until Henry Hines came along and discovered the secret to long-lasting ketchup that it became both commercial and viable. He developed a recipe that used ripe red tomatoes, which contained the natural preservative pectin, and he dramatically increased the amount of vinegar. It's a distant relative of the fish sources that sparked it, but East and Southeast Asia's etymological influence on ketchup remains. In a company statement from Heinz to China Daily in 2013, the ketchup giant finally acknowledged the Chinese roots of the word. The statement said that Heinz changed the way they spelled the product from catsup to ketchup in order to stand out among its competitors. These words ketchup and catsup were used interchangeably during ketchup's rise in the West, along with more variations on the hot keen, including ketchup. Three tomatoes are walking down the street. Papa tomato, mama tomato, and baby tomato. Baby tomato starts lagging behind and Papa tomato gets really angry, goes back and squishes him, says, All of these are classic examples of Westerners making those unfamiliar words easier to chew. Tea is now the second most popular drink in the world after water. While the classic brew is widely seen as a humble everyday beverage to help grease the wheels in the morning, it is also quite literally steeped in rich history and traditions. From the pinky raising ritual of English afternoon tea, or a hobbit's fifth meal of the day, to the traditional Chinese tea ceremony, or cha dao, which involves a bride and groom on their wedding day preparing tea for their parents to ensure future happiness, there is a lot more to the bitter ground up leaves we fling into our mugs. When first introduced to Europe from Asia in the 1600s, tea was extremely expensive and often kept under lock and key. They would often be stored in one of these, what was then called a tea canister, but would eventually become called tea caddy two centuries later. Caddy means an airtight box, jar or other receptacle used to store and preserve tea. The pricier kinds of caddy were also signs of social status and would often come with silver spoons for shoveling with. The word caddy evolved from the unit of measurement called catty, which is still widely used across East and Southeast Asia for weighing food like fruit and veg at street markets. The term coexisted with the Malaysian word catty, both equating to around 600 grams. The catty measurement was adopted by early European settlers and eventually passed into English in the 1800s as a tea caddy, the box for storing the tea. So next time you pop the kettle on or think of spilling the tea to your mates, or accuse something of being weak tea, as Larry Wilmore does, spare a thought for the caddy which gave tea its cultural grandeur and importance today. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for checking out our channel. Remember to like and subscribe to catch another round of pub-worthy word history trivia from Alex and G.